Reading the world with Lego Serious Play. And I'm going to share a few thoughts about what we, did, we read, the text by Paulo Freire about the importance of the act of reading. And I'm going to connect this reading with uh, this practice of visualizing and manipulating ideas and concepts using Lego. We're going to use this a lot in this studio. And you should know why I use that so much. But before I talk about Lego series play, I have to provide a little bit of context um, about this text that you just read. Paulo Freire, uh, a man who was born in, um, in the northeast part of Brazil, which is a, a poor area, a lot of illiterate people, especially in the time that he was living there. He was a Brazilian educator who made ad adult education a means to transform reality. Who knew about Paulo Freire before reading this text? Please raise your hand. Just to have a Yeah, so you knew about them, about him. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. You wrote about it. <laughs> We're going to read your article next week, by the way. Anyway, uh, Paulo Freire is widely known in many countries, especially those from the Global South. Because what he did is not just relevant to Brazil, it's also relevant to any other situations where there are oppressed people. And the oppressed, oppressed people in his context were the people that lived in rural areas or they recently moved to urban areas in Brazil and they didn't have, they couldn't read and write. So they were illiterate people. And that those times in the 50s and 60s, and this amounted for 40% of Brazilian population. And according at that moment, there was a a, a, a legislation that didn't pre, that prevented them from voting. If you could not read and write, you could not vote. Paulo Freire wanted to change uh, the country by changing the conditions of access to democracy, because he believed that since these people could not vote the politicians, they were not taking their best interest into consideration. Therefore, he started to devise a national, first it was a local um, literacy program that grew and then become a national literacy program that would enable these people who could not read and write to uh, get the minimum what they need to vote. So he created a, a a method for literacy uh, called Paulo Freire method. Now that's what is known. He didn't give any specific name for it. And it's based on three elements, visual codification. So there were artists working with Paulo Freire to create visuals that would uh, let the people understand the concrete representation, the world before learning the word. And the, the words, they were carefully chosen to provoke debate. That's why they are called generative words. Because if we read those words like voto, which means vote, we would have a debate, what does it mean? Some people would say, oh, it's no point, useless. Other people would say, wow, we can change a lot. There is a hope around vote. And the first, last but not least, dialogue, uh, talking about uh, what we are doing. And I, I, I forgot to mention also participatory research is an important one. So what are the words that can generate debate? You usually have to do a, an ethnographic research. You have to go into the world of these people and get those words that these people are using. And, and for example, voto is a common word in Brazil, but they also made uh, pictures of belota, which is a very specific local word that on, is only used in that region in Brazil. I don't didn't even know what this word means coming from the south. And the reason behind is very intricate. I'm going to very be very quick here on summarizing it. Basically, the pictures of concrete situations enable the people to reflect on their former interpretation of the world before going to read the word. And you're going to see that Paulo Freire is always proposing us to read and reread and reread creating more and more layers of reflections. Because if we reflect, uh, we also include ourselves as part of the world. 
And if we include ourselves as part of the world, we can change the world because we see that the world is not fixed and, and because we know that we are changing. So why can't the world change? It's only because only you, you believe that the world doesn't change if you think that the world is outside of yourself. You are out of the world. But if you're part of the world and you change, the world is seen as changeable. Here's how he operationalized this in the circles of culture, one element of he, this uh, literacy method. The circles of culture is similar to what we did here. So we have a, a discussion about the text we read, but instead of having a text right away for illiterate people, for people who could not read, they would have images, generative images, images that would generate debate. So this discussion was about what is the cultural relevance of the, all of the objects we have around us? Are they all also part of culture? If you can read those objects, you're already reading. So that was his point. So he, the students that would go to these programs, they were not like children that are still learning about what its objects are. They know a lot about the world. They are adults. They just cannot operate with words, but they can operate with images. So making them feel confident that they can do something was essential for this method. Instead of telling them, you, don't, you know nothing, here is everything you need to know, you are stupid, you are ignorant, you start from what they already know. And a picture is something that they right away recognize and they say, wow, that's a vase, I know this. And why is it, is it uh, decorated? They can tell a lot of things about this. Why do we have uh, flowers on top? They can tell a lot of things. So they know a lot of things that are coded into their worlds, not through words. And by letting them be uh, uh, aware that they are reading before they read the word, so reading the world, right? They get more confident to read the word. So there's something very designerly about this approach. Think about it, how much knowledge we as designers put into the world, not through words. Most of the time, we are codifying things, even if we are using typography in our graphic designs, we are not necessarily using typography as text. Sometimes we use typography as image. We are coding knowledge into the world and people read that knowledge. But if you reread, it means that you start to see that from a different perspective. And the next slide in their presentation is, is super powerful because He's just doing this uh, zoom out activity that you see so many movies that like blows your mind because you see the context behind something that I wasn't being shown, right? This is what cinematographers use a lot to reveal something, a breakthrough about their characters. And he is he's using this uh, uh, tool in the 60s, even before cinematographers started using this kind of uh, zoom out activity. And he was showing um, the students themselves looking at the vase, the picture of the vase. So students would say, hey, is this like me there in the picture? Why is uh, provoking? Because he wants to draw the attention that those words that we are speaking now are also culture and they are also being written and read because we also use uh, spoken language. They were also very competent on that. So getting the word is just a next step. It's not that far away. It's not something possible to get. So he's making a bridge between the knowledge that students had already and the new knowledge that they need to get to read the word. And then he became famous by synthesizing everything I just said in those very simple sentence. Reading the world precedes reading the word. It's also an interesting rephrasing of the famous existentialist philosophical uh, sentence, philosophical motto, which is existence precedes essence. I'm not going to go deep into this. I'm not even going to talk anything besides that. But if you want to know more about the philosophical aspects of this um, literacy method, it comes from understanding ourselves into the world, which is existence going forward and getting more detail about this method. Um, after 
they realize that they are reading the world, then the word will be introduced with a generative image on the background. So you will see tijolo, the word, and a picture of someone either making a brick, that's what it means, tijolo, or using a brick to build a construction. This was an um, image used in Brasilia, a place, the new city, the modern city that Brazil was building at that time. And this was a picture used in Northeast where they were not making those huge buildings, but actually th that's where they build the bricks themselves and then they export it to Brasilia. So they would use images that would make sense to the localities because Brazil is a huge country and people in the Northeast might not be so uh, acquainted with what this context and the opposite is also the same. They might, people in Brazil might not even know how these bricks are fabricated. And after they got this word, they would break down the word into syllables, syllables and then each syllable would have a variation. For example, ta, uh, t, this is the first uh, syllable here, then you will get g and then li, which are variations using the same letters in the word. So you would not learn right away all the words or in an alphabetical order. You would only use the parts of the that word that are, that you have already learned. So you basically play out with what you've got. And then you would combine differently what you had already have to generate new knowledge. So trying to get as much as knowledge you can with the, the least amount of effort initially to uh, appropriate new things. So this was the key uh, aspect in terms of um, educational techniques that he used. Through this method, Paulo Freire and, uh, and his collaborators, they um, helped 300 rural workers in Angicos town learn how to read and write in only 40 contact hours. It was a really impressive uh, achievement that attracted the attention of a lot of people, even outside of Brazil. <coughs> And the elections prospects in that town completely changed. When he started trying to do an, a national program that would maybe change the whole Brazil, and that was a, a, a that was a, a coup d'état. So they overthrown the government in Brazil. Yeah, it ceased to be a democracy, and the military uh, took over the country for almost twenty years. Uh, Paulo Freire was immediately persecuted in prison and had to go in exile. He lived in many countries. He stayed in the US for a while. And for that reason, a lot of people got to know his work in the US. A lot of people read Pedagogy of the Oppressed here. That's his main uh, work. And that's also one of the reasons why it's being banned in the US because people believe this kind of uh, uh, literature is not appropriate for kids in public schools and not everyone what i mean they believe this is this is kind of um an indoctrination of the left nowadays uh it's not no longer forbidden in arizona but it was for a while in two years ago and knowing this political scenario and understanding the relevance of paulo freire in a similar situation in brazil in the 2020 under the bolsonaro's rules we founded the Design and Oppression Network uh, together with other researchers in Brazil that were interested on exploring what does Paulo Freire has to do with design. Uh, we had um, a lot of reading groups online and other activities, but mostly what it got is this presentation. We tried different ways of uh, reading and rewrite and rewriting the design world that we live in. So how, how can we make design uh, a tool or a, a process for us to change our worlds. I was particularly interested in using Lego because I used that before for co-designing with users. For example, these people in this picture are redesigning their um, visual system of their solidarity entrepreneurship. So they had this kind of small business that produced some local food and other kinds of um, goods and, and Lego was essential for them to learn how to deal with graphic representation, conceptual representing their businesses. 
what I learned so far after experimenting with Lego many ways is that uh, co-designers, they can read and write the world as if it was a system. So they can see the world as things that are interconnected. It's definitely a s simplification of what the world is. So the world is not completely um, modeled by Lego. There are some nuances that you cannot represent through those systems. But so far, so good. You get a, a big picture of it. Because Lego is a microcosm of the modern world, a mass-produced objects that can be combined and recombined in so many different designs. So Lego is a cornerstone representation of what design is in our society, basically in US society. Uh, let me put that straight. Uh, Lego series play method is a method that amplifies uh, the usage of Lego toys for business purposes and education and learning. It enables the block system to represent abstract systems of any kind, not just physical. Mobility safety system of a city. This is a project I've done with Alianza para Mobilidade Popular, a group of people that try to promote usage of bicycles in Curitiba City. And also the outreach system of UF's College of the Arts. This is very recent. I've done this workshop last week and we map the different outreach projects and how they connect together in our college. Lego Series Play relies on physical metaphors. <clears throat> A handful of building blocks can represent any object. Here you see, for example, two objects, two blocks representing an airplane. But if you push the metaphor of a metaphor of a metaphor, you get these two objects, these two blocks to represent speed, to represent uh, international relationships. All of that can be represented using those two bricks. <clears throat> and if you start relating different, uh, different bricks, you create more complex metaphors. And they are very good for naming the world when we don't have words for naming that. <clears throat> so first name it using Lego, and then later on you name it using word. It creates a bridge between what you already know and what you need to know. <clears throat> After the world is named with the metaphorical model, words are then extracted from the model. That's a metaphor, of course, we don't take them <laughs> physically. We take them, uh, let's say, uh, cognitively but so far so good you end up having a post-it or a sticky note with the writings I could have asked right away so what is your outreach project just write down and not post it right you do this all the time so you can see there are a lot of post-it notes on these walls because we have been asking people to think about something and right away write down and post it but I have found out that if you ask right away people to write down they may not have words. They may know the thing. They just don't know how to express it. Having some time, having a little bit of time with Lego before you write down the word helps to understand the world. That's the tricky thing. You know the world, you just don't know the word. You use a representation of the world that's more concrete, a generative, like a generative image that we saw before, those paintings. Paulo Freire is very uh, interested on learning the word to change the world, right? So that's what he's writing on the pedagogy of the oppressed. It's an entirely uh, different work than this, the act of reading, the part of the reading that you just read. And over there, he's very philosophical. So he says, to exist humanly is to name the world, to change it. Once named the world, in, turns, in its turn, reappears to the namers as a problem and requires them of a new naming. That means the world is never done. The world's completely changing and we are part of it. And once we name it, the world strikes us back with new things to change. And then we have to have new names for it. And that grows your, uh, the scope of the world, perceived world. So you perceive more worlds this is expressed in this very uh, interesting sentence. So he says right on the first page, 
The understanding attained by critical reading of a text implies perceiving the relationship between text and context. And I couldn't only find this so quick in the text because I took notes on here, right? So I'm, so I'm suggesting strongly that you take notes because then you remember exactly what you have uh, read that part. But this is a graphical representation of the Paulo Freire method. So you have a text but before you read the text, you read the context of the text. And you go back and forth. So there is this two-way movement between reading the text and the context. And sometimes you use images as a kind of a, a bridge between text and context. And that's the same what we do in expansive design, which is my, my PhD thesis, by the way, an approach where you use um, math, uh, many different representations of contradictions like Lego series play, but also games and theater, to understand the differences between design and co-design. Co-design for me means context. But context uh, is also the, the word that we use for text. That's why I prefer to relate co-design with design. I don't call design a text because design and text are different things. Design is codified through other languages and things that are not even languages. That's why I'm not using the word context here around design. I use co-design. So co-design is not an approach in expensive design. It's not a method. Think about co-design is already in the world. There's a lot of people co-designing every design. We may not be aware of it. One way how to provoke people to become more aware of this co-design thing is to use generative images in a form of card decks. This is a specific card deck that uh, students of mine in Brazil have designed to uh, represent existential crises that design students typically go through. We have used it last um, spring and students, they, after they chose one crisis they are facing, they represent that using Lego series play. And She's not here, the author of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in this situation, the person who made this model could talk about something which is hard to tell otherwise. For example, feeling a um, bit uh, challenged by having to break free from the bubble, the protection that this person is experiencing and have to talk to people, different people that have so many different backgrounds and and, and they, they, they may be challenging and difficult to relate to yours. So this person represents this using this model, which is hard for us to read if we are not listening to the video audio recording of that session. In initial stages of a project, it's easier and quicker to co-design with Lego than with other materials. So you may want to use prefer to use post-its, you may prefer to use uh, sketchbooks, you may prefer to use computers, but that's only because you have a lot of experience with those materials. If you haven't, have, have, haven't had so much experience with those materials, you would rather prefer Lego. And I've, I've done this many times with many different kind of people, even people who have never seen Lego before, they find it easier to express themselves using Lego. <coughs> Because especially Lego Duplo has some very easy affordance. It's designed for, for babies to play out, right? Uh, so uh, it's very simple to handle and you don't require so much dexterity or uh, ability on your hands uh, to build it. And that's a divergence from the traditional Lego series play model that uses the, the simple finer grained uh, traditional Lego. I use Duplo precisely because I'm trying to include people that have a hard time to play or didn't have much Lego experience in their childhood. Well, another thing that I also add to this um, method is recording the model presentation to the author's smartphone to let that person later on read and reread the model and think about it, reflect further. So I don't record in my phone. You will see me asking so who's going to record this? Because uh, if you record and you're going to reread it, not me. I <laughs> Maybe I will reread it again if you share it. But I'm mostly interested on your on promoting 
learning across among ourselves. And here is a person who's rereading the 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 legal series play model over and over again. That person is Hien Fan. She's a third year uh, researcher here from the MXT program. And uh, she will see the recording later on. Don't worry about that. She's not here now. <laughs> uh, because she's one of the few of students who really took this seriously. And she's um, making so many models. And an interesting thing is that I went back to all the models that she was making in our cl pre past classes and see how her definition of her research changed across time. The first model that she built in our, our, one of our classes was in um, February, last, uh, beginning of this year. And she was talking about something like, yeah, moving between different contexts, something completely different than what she's doing now, which is studying the contradiction of diversity in the design education. So, in you know, a few months, she's completely changing, but the way she understands the the world, but the world itself is there. The contradiction was always there. She was just trying to find the right words for it. And as as soon as she got the right word, the manipulating that contradiction became even more um, uh, stronger on her side. So she could uh, take hold of it and develop more critical consciousness of it. And she did not only use uh, Lego series play on my classes, but also uh, in, in her further investigations with other students. So she's interviewing other students about their uh, experience at MXT and asking them to build uh, Lego series play models. She's also using that in our um, uh, in, uh, advisory meetings. And yeah, and also she's using uh, the undergrad teaching activities. So I'm, I'm sharing this because you might also want to use those materials. They are available to you. They are also available in this. So you see two boxes here in our studio. <clears throat> We're going to use those here, but you can also use a 310 in our teaching uh, room if you want to experiment and, uh, with your undergrad students. Finally, last but not least, I discovered that LEGO series play models, they are generative objects pretty much like generative images and words, they are objects that generate other objects. You can use Lego Source Play to design new objects. In the dialogical making activity, Lego Source Play only works if you are talking with other people. If you are alone, it's not very powerful. You have to have another person to talk about it. But uh, if you have more people, then you have more diverse viewpoints. It's more rich. And finally, a uh, cultural reference here. Teachers who combine critical pedagogy with Lego series play can literally avoid being another brick and the wall. You know, <laughs> uh, what I mean by that is that you are still a brick in the wall, but you're not another brick. You are that special brick that will enable students to reread their world and understand what is to be like a brick and why does the brick has to be like a brick so what is the framework that the brick is in with and how can we actually change those bricks and rearrange them and maybe uh, build something which is not a wall. You can take, take a look later on the, of the references if you want to dig deeper into this topic. The pedagogy of the press is definitely the best uh, readings for this kind of uh, understanding whatever I was trying to explain to you, what is running between the lines too. And I'm gonna upload this and put it on, on Canvas so you don't need to take pictures now. Yeah, that's it for now. Um,